Today's reading is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 to the end of chapter 4. It's found on page 1188 of the Church Bible. The coming of the Lord. Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, we who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. This is the word of God. Good morning, everyone. Um, why don't we just start with a word of prayer? Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are Lord of all. Lord, thank you that we can gather here this morning um, in this service of remembrance, Lord. Be close to us, draw close to us, we pray in this time. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. It really is a privilege um, to be with you and to share on Remembrance Sunday. Um, my name is Katie, and I'm sure we all have different ways in which we relate personally to Remembrance Day. I know for me, I think of my grandpa, um, who's died now, but he grew up in a small village, the same village as I grew up in Devon. And even though he'd never, ever left the village, never been to school or anything, ended up at 17 in World War II, going to Burma, um, being lost in the jungle for a few months. And I often think of him on a day like today and think what effect that must have had on him at the age. I'm sure we all have different personal ways of relating. And even if we don't, when we look around us today, we see that we're still a world at war, aren't we? We only have to look at the Ukraine, what's unfolding in Israel and Gaza, Afghanistan. We are not a place at peace. But as Christians, we look to the image that we see in Revelation 21, where it says there will be no more tears, no more pain, no more suffering. These things will have passed. That's what we long for. But we're not there yet. We're not in that place yet. There's still pain and there's still suffering. And this passage that we've had um, read to us this morning um, in Thessalonians, Paul is trying to explore with the Christians um, in Thessalonica, how do we hold this space? We're not there yet. We're still in a place where there's pain and suffering. So what do we do now? How do we, how do we inhabit this space as Christians? So I'd encourage you um, to keep your Bibles open. If you've opened it on that passage in um, Thessalonians, keep it open because we'll be having a look back at that text. We'll be thinking about what is unique about being a Christian in the face of grief and suffering and death. And the heart of this message, the heart of what I want to unpack this morning, is hope. The difference that it makes being a Christian in the midst of pain and grief is not that we don't feel it, it's not that we don't experience it, but it's that we have true hope through what Jesus has done on the cross. But before we, before we completely dive into this idea of hope, 
I just want us to like unpack the context a bit of this letter. The letter of um, 1 Thessalonians, it's really short, it's only five chapters, and we're in at chapter four. So it's helpful just to have a little bit of background as to how Paul's got to this point. I don't know if you can um, recall to mind maybe a time when you've had your work reviewed by someone. Maybe someone's come into your workplace, they've observed you doing something, you've had that sort of feeling of nerves and anticipation, maybe it's university school, whatever your context is, maybe just try and bring that to mind. Someone's come in to almost do an inspection. Well, my husband and I, we've recently started looking at schools for our eldest child, Jesse, who'll be starting school in September. And we've been going to the schools, looking around, talking to the teachers, talking to the parents. But the other thing we've been doing is reading the Ofsted reports. Now, if you're a teacher, you're probably like, that word Ofsted probably sends a shiver up your spine. <laughs> um, if you're not familiar what Ofsted is, it's basically the body that um, looks at schools and educational providers and says, okay, this is their mission, this is their goals. Are they delivering this? How's it going, basically? And what we find in this letter to the Thessalonians, it's a little bit like an Ofsted report. It's like a review. Paul's saying, you've become Christians. You know, it was amazing. We read back in Acts 17 about this community, this diverse community of Jews and Greeks coming to faith in God. Hallelujah. Paul's like, this was amazing. You've done that. You've committed to him. But he's seen all of the odds they're up against. And, he's, and Paul's thought, you know, I'm going to have to send my friend Timothy in. I'm going to just send him over and just check. How are they actually doing? Just do a little... Um, Timothy, can you go and just do a little investigation for me? I want to know, how are they actually getting along with following Jesus as their Lord? And the good news is that overwhelmingly, the report is positive. I don't know if it'd be good or excellent, outstanding, wherever you'd put it, but the report is really positive. We read in chapter 3, we read, um, we read, we read um, Paul writing, Timothy's brought good news about your faith and love. You're standing firm in the Lord against the odds of temptation and persecution, he wants to encourage them. You know, most reports have a sort of encouragement, don't they, at the start? But we all know that next usually comes the room for improvement. <laughs> and in chapter four, we're finding ourselves in the room for improvement part of this letter. Paul's desperate to see this community grow in discipleship to grow into what it really means to love Jesus as their Lord. What does that actually mean for their lives? And the particular area, and it's, and it's very pertinent for us on Remembrance Sunday, that he's looking to sort of help them understand today that we've heard read, is what do we do as Christians when someone dies? How do we understand it? How do we grieve? How do we remember? Biblical um, scholars think that this community, this community of Thessalonians, that we read about how close they are, how much they loved one another. And they think that what probably happened was that they were grieving. They just lost loved ones. They were in the depths and despair of grief. And so they were asking all the questions, you know, but what about my, my friend? You know, he didn't know about Jesus. So do, does he get in? Does he get into heaven? What about so-and-so? What about my sister? Or my mum, what, what happens to them? I'm sure there's people here that can relate to that real sense of anxiety. What has happened to that person I love? And it's interesting, isn't it? How does Paul answer this question? He doesn't actually sort of directly go to that who, what and where. He doesn't say, oh, yeah, actually, you know, don't worry, because um, John Smith, he's on my list, so he definitely got in. And, you know, all of those that actually came to the Lord before the middle of May last year, they're in as well, so don't worry. He doesn't sort of go into those anxieties, does he? What does Paul do? He says, I don't want you to be misinformed about those who have died. What I really want you to focus on, he starts in verse 14. He says, what we believe is that Jesus died and rose again. This is what I want you to focus on. Come back a minute, come back a minute. Jesus died and he rose again. 
why is Paul reminding them of this? It almost seems like really obvious, doesn't it? Of course, you know, Jesus died on the cross. You can almost imagine them thinking like, oh, we know that, but what's going to happen to so-and-so and so-and-so? But it's almost like Paul's saying, I want this head knowledge to become heart knowledge. Jesus died and he rose again. <coughs> the Thessalonians, it's like they, they had their love for God. They confessed that Jesus was Lord. But how much had the truth of Jesus' death and resurrection really transformed their lives from the inside out? Paul writes in other, other letters in the New Testament, in 2 Corinthians, he writes, um, anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. To what extent had they become completely new creations in everything they did, everything they said, the way they approached all challenges in their lives? It seems that, and this is something I can definitely relate to, in the middle of their fear and anxiety and grief, their stress about what might happen in the future, they'd lost sight about what had happened in history for them through Jesus' death and resurrection. So Paul points them back. He says, wait a minute, look back. Remember what Christ has done on the cross. This isn't something that's uncertain. This is something that's true. And this truth transforms your today. Paul reminds them of what God has done in the past because it's that that secures their future and transforms their present. So what does reminding them about this new identity actually, um, actually mean? What does it do in the context of their questions about grief? Well, he says, you're, you're a new creation, you have a new perspective. And so that's why in that first verse we've had read, verse 13, it says, so you do not grieve like those who don't have hope. Because you have hope. Because of what Jesus has done on the cross, you have hope. Those who don't believe that Jesus has conquered death, death is the end then. There's nothing else. But you Christians, remember, you believe that Jesus has defeated death, that he promises to return again in the future. I was doing a little Google search of like, how do you define hope? And a few really interesting things came up. One of them said, um, hope is more than just being expectant. It's more certain than that. There's a certainty to hope. I know this will happen. Another said that, um, Another said that hope is future orientated. It's something you believe will be fulfilled. Christian hope is that death does not have the final word. In Romans um, 5, it says, hope does not put us to shame. This isn't a sort of like airy fairy thing that, you know, a few sort of optimistic people um, cling on to. Christian hope doesn't put us to shame because of what Jesus has done. And this changes, what Paul's saying, this, this changes how you grieve. This changes how you remember those that you love. Feels quite significant as we remember today. But what's so important to hear, and it's always so important that we actually read what the text says, Paul doesn't say, don't grieve. Paul says, don't grieve like those who don't have hope. We're going to grieve, we're going to experience loss and pain, and I'm sure there's people here this morning where that is really the situation you're in right now. Maybe you relate to the words of Psalm 23 when it says you're like walking through the valley of the shadow of death. Maybe that's where you feel you are. Paul doesn't say don't grieve. Look at the response when Jesus died. Look at Mary, look at the disciples, they were in agony, they were in despair, they were absolutely distraught. It's okay to grieve. And I think that those of us here, I know that I've had this before as well, um, sometimes as Christians, like almost trying to encourage one another, we say, we say you know, they're, they're in a better place, or they're with the Lord, or da 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 but actually sometimes, even though we're trying to encourage one another, we try and rush people past grief. But grief is an important part of when we experience the loss of someone we love. 
Paul doesn't say don't do it. He says don't do it like those who don't have hope. Because as Christians, when we grieve, our grief is held in the arms of hope. It's like bookended in hope. It's not the end of the story. Death is not the end of the story. I had a really helpful analogy for this the other day that maybe resonated with me because it's um, fairly recent in my living memory. But I heard someone compare this um, to childbirth. Don't worry, I'm not going to enter gory details. Um, but someone said, um, when, you know, as Christians, when we, um, when we become Christians, it's not like a woman who's in labor who gets given an epidural and suddenly experiences no pain, none of the agony of the contractions, none of the agony of sort of delivering a baby into the world. Being a Christian isn't like receiving an epidural to numb our pain of grief and loss and suffering. What it is like, though, is it's like having a midwife alongside you that says, OK, I see, I see you're panicking now, but, you know, hope is coming. New life is coming. You know, you're going to meet your baby. So come on, let's just sort of get this in perspective. You know, I know it's painful now, but I, I'm with you. I'm holding your hand. I'm alongside you. It's like God does that for us in our pain. He gets alongside us. He's holding our hand. He's saying, there is hope. There is new life coming at the end of this. This is the, not the place you're going to be in forever, but I know it hurts now. Being a Christian doesn't mean that the pain of death and loss and remembering is taken from us, but it does mean we have hope. And hope does not put us to shame. So what do we do then? Because, you know, it's really easy, isn't it, to sort of say, you know, as Christians we have hope and it sounds great when we're at church on a Sunday. But what, how do we actually do that? You know, it's so hard to put that into practice, isn't it? I think there's a few things. We've sort of looked at it already, haven't we? Like remind ourselves of what Jesus has done through reading scripture, through spending time in prayer and saying, Lord, just give me that revelation of what you have done. Give me that perspective that I can have through your, the hope that I know you will give. But the other thing, and it's like really practical, and I love this, how Paul ends in verse 18. He's, he's almost like, don't do it on your own. None of you can do suffering and pain and grief on your own. Like, we're all human. It's, it's going to bring us down if we try and struggle on our own. So he says, therefore, encourage one another with these words. This is a gift of Christian community. This is a gift of the body of Christ. Is we pick each other up, we encourage each other with the truth when one of our brothers or sisters is struggling. We can encourage one another to have hope maybe when we're struggling ourselves. So as we um, come into land, I think Paul's encouragement to the Thessalonians, his reminder to have hope, a hope that is something so dependable, that doesn't put us to shame, that is based on truth that has happened in history when Jesus Christ died on the cross. His reminder to do that feels like such an important reminder for us today as we remember those who have given themselves, sacrificed themselves in war, <coughs> maybe as it brings our own griefs and sufferings and losses to mind. That reminder that there is hope. And perhaps also the reminder, maybe what today does, is it gives us an opportunity to be a bit vulnerable with one another. To say, actually, no, life isn't always easy, and I don't always feel hopeful in the midst of my suffering. And maybe there's an opportunity at the end of the service to pray for one another, if that's, if that's where you're at, to encourage one another afterwards when we're having coffee or in our small groups, to send someone that text or ring them in the week and encourage them and say, there is hope, even though I know it's painful now. Shall we pray?
Lord Jesus, thank you for what you have done on the cross, that when you died, you didn't stay in the grave. You rose again, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We just pray right now that by your spirit, Lord, you will give each of us a fresh revelation of what that actually means, what that actually gives us. It transforms us, Lord. And you call us to be your transformed people on the earth today, Lord, your beacons of hope. And Father God, I just pray for those which, particularly right now, today, whether it's because of Remembrance Sunday and specifically what that brings up, or because of this whole sort of conversation about grief and loss, where that is particularly painful, Lord Jesus. Lord, we pray that you step in, like the comforting, um, encouraging perspective that a midwife can bring, Lord. We pray that you get alongside and help us get alongside one another, Lord Jesus, to receive your hope that is available to us now, Lord. We ask this in your name. Amen.